OK, can you see it? Yes. OK, awesome. All right, so today we're going to speak of periodontics, OK, and it is going to tie up to this whole thing that we've been doing um, in lab and in lecture is perio. So the dental assistant in the periodontal office must have a thorough understanding of periodontal diseases and the types of periodontal instruments and procedures. In a periodontal practice, the dental assistant will assist with periodontal charting and periodontal surgeries and provide home care instruction to the patient. So when you guys come back to lab, we will do periodontal charting. It's much easier I think to do it in person. I will try to videotape it and see if you guys understand it, but we'll do a couple of practices probably in lab also. Now, periodontal disease, it's a disease and it's a disease of the gums. Perio, I mentioned this to you, means tissues, gums, okay? Now, in the periodontal practice, patients are referred by the general dentist or the hygienist for treatment of a periodontal condition. And after the periodontal treatment, the patient will return to the regular general dentist or routine or for routine dental care. Now, frequently, periodontal patients will alternate periodontal maintenance cleaning appointments between the periodontist office and the general dentist office. So once they have periodontal disease, they have to keep uh, maintenance on it and they'll go and see the periodontist who's the specialist and then they'll go back to the general dentist and they'll alternate. Now the staff in the two office they coordinate periodontal maintenance therapy between the two practices to provide comprehensive care for the patient. Also the periodontist will send reports to the regular dentist the general dentist to let him know how the patient is doing. Now a periodontal examination includes medical and dental history, radiographic evaluations, which is x-rays, examination of the teeth, tissues, supporting structures, the periodontal charting, which includes pocket readings, furcation, tooth mobility, exudate means pus, and gingival recession. So this is what I was talking about, about a periodontal chart. Now this one, of course, is electronic. The one that we'll be doing is on paper. If you could do it on paper, believe me, you will be able to do it on computer. So the doctor will take his periodontal probe and he will call out numbers and then the numbers will be transposed to uh, the chart, whether it is electronic or paper. <clears throat> now, medical and dental history, systemic diseases such as acquired immune, immunodeficiency syndrome, or HIV infection and diabetes can decrease resistance of the tissue to infection. Dental history is used to gather information about conditions that could indicate periodontal disease. For example, patients with periodontal disease often complain of bleeding gums, loose teeth, or bad taste in the mouth. Now, during the dental examination, the doctor will also check for mobility. It is normal for teeth to have a slight amount of mobility, which is tooth movement, because of the cushioning effect of the periodontal membrane. But excessive mobility can be an important sign of periodontal disease. So mobility is recorded with a scale. Zero is normal, one is slight, two is moderate, and three is extreme. This is how the doctor will check for mobility. He will take the back of a mouth mirror and possibly the back of another instrument and kind of tap the teeth back and, and move them or try to move them a little bit back and forth. And he will let you know if the teeth are mobile. OK, now oral tissues and supporting structures. The periodontal examination includes assessments of the amounts of plaque and calculus changes in gingival health and bleeding, assessment of the level of bone, and detection of periodontal pockets. Periodontal probing of periodontal pocket results when the gingival sulcus becomes deeper than normal. So anything on the three is normal. Periodontal probing measures how much epithelial attachment has been lost to disease. The greater the depth of the periodontal pocket, the greater the loss of epithelial attachment. 
and bone and the more serious the periodontal disease. Periodontal pockets are very difficult and sometimes impossible for the patient to clean. And what instrument we use to check the pockets? Periodontal probe. So here is on one side letter A, or uh, this would be the normal side, okay? Um, showing normal sulcus death. Here's the gingiva, okay? So enamel, dentin, the gingiva, and then you have the cementum, the alveolar bone, and the apical foramen. On the same side, on B, on the opposite side, you have the same thing, but look at the gingiva. So the gingiva here was normal. Over here, you have calculus. So what happens? The tissue starts separating or detaching, okay? And uh, that's the epithelial attachment and you start getting a pocket and the calculus keeps on building up, building up, building up. This is where they stick the probe in, okay? So if this is normal, it would be anything under three and then here it will be higher. This is what it would look like with the periodontal probe. So this is the periodontal probe and it has measurements on it. Again, when you come into lab or look in your instrument book, these markings will be in black, okay? and they measure six depths. So they measured the distal buckle, the buckle, the mesial buckle. So three on the buckle side, and then the distal lingual, the lingual, and the mesial lingual. So all on the lingual side, three and three, that's six. Okay, so six areas that they measure uh, the pockets. Usually the highest measurements are where? Interproximal because people are not flossing. Now, early signs of periodontal disease, changes in the gingiva, color, size, shape, and texture, inflammation, bleeding, exudate, which again I mentioned is pus, and development of periodontal pockets. Now, bleeding index. Here is a perfect example of what I was telling you they measure uh, with the perio probe. So if this is the tooth, they go to the distal, the buccal, and the mesial, all on the buccal side. Then they go to the distal, the lingual, and the mesial lingual, all on the lingual side. That's your six probes uh, that the doctor takes. If it's not the doctor, then it will be the hygienist, okay? So they are checking to uh, see how severe the inflammation of the gingiva is, and they measure it again with a periodontal probe. Now, when you take x-rays and you look at x-rays, okay, it will show bone loss. So the letter A is showing vertical bone loss. By the way, this is the coronal portion of the teeth. The gum should be where the coronal portion is, where my arrow is going across. A, look at it all the way up here, and then B over here. This is the crestal ridge. It's basically at normal height, because remember I said where the coronal portion is. So that's pretty normal. Going back to C over here, this is the alveolar crest already. It's um, We have periodontal pockets over here. And then D, oh my God, this is super severe. Okay, so this is pretty bad over here. So now this x-ray here is ver um, horizontal and this x-ray is vertical. Now a lot of the periodontists, they like this type of x-ray, the long way instead of the horizontal. So they like vertical because it shows more of um, the crestal bone loss, okay? So they can see better this way how much bone they have lost. So again, the bone should be right here on this molar of letter A, but over here it starts dipping. Over here it starts dipping a little bit. Here is really dipping. So again, where do you mostly see this? See in the interproximal, this has a lot to do with uh, lack of flossing and lack of coming in to have your teeth clean and the calculus buildup. Periodontal instruments, periodontal therapy requires the use of specialized instruments to remove calculus, smooth root surfaces, measure periodontal pockets, and perform periodontal surgery. What is calculus? Calculus is hard mineralized plaque. When it gets hard, it's very hard for the patient to take it off. That's why they have to come into the office so it could be removed with the instruments. So in general, the, dental, the dentist or the hygienist uses these instruments 
and they take responsibility for maintaining their sharpness also. Sometimes you'll hear the hygienist sharpening her tool, uh, her, not tools, her instruments in the office. Periodontal probes. Now it's used to locate and measure the depth of periodontal pockets. On some types of probes, the tip is color coded to make the measurement easier to read. Uh, the hygienists usually like those better instead of it being all metal. Periodontal probe is tapered to fit into the gingival sulcus and it has a blunt or rounded tip. Now it's blunt, but for people who have perio disease, to them it feels sharp. And again, six measurements are recorded. So again, this is what your periodontal probe looks like. Uh, you know, some some of them I've seen them with red color. Um, again, some I've seen them all silver, but these are really good because once you get to that measurement, you know anything above it, then we're talking about uh, past the black lines, perio. Then the doctors use explorers to locate supergingival and subgingival calculus deposits and provide tactile information to the operator about the roughness or smoothness of the root surfaces. Longer, more curved than those used for carry detection. The working ends of periodontal explorers are thin and fine and easy manipulated around root surfaces. Also long enough to be capable of reaching to the bases of deep pockets and frications. Now the difference between super gingival, that means above the gums, and sub gingival is below or beneath the gums. And again, they may use the explorer for uh, the things that I mentioned. Okay, they go in uh, exactly how it is over here. Okay, if you look in the pictures. Now, scalers and files. Sickle scalers are used primarily to remove large deposits of super gingival calculus. Chisel scalers are used to remove supra gingival calculus in the contact area of anterior teeth. The blade on the chisel scaler is curved slightly to adapt to the two surfaces. Hole scalers are used to remove heavy supergingival calculus. Holes are more uh, most effective when used on buccal and lingual surfaces of the posterior teeth. So the most commonly one used is the sickle. The contra angle sickle scaler um, has a it, its angle at the shank and is designed to remove calculus from the posterior teeth. And the scalers are very pointy, so be careful that you don't prick yourself, especially after uh, the hygienist or the doctor has used it on a patient. Now, your curettes are used to remove subgingival calculus. <clears throat> Excuse me. Smooth rust surfaces, root planing, and remove the disease soft tissue lining of the periodontal pocket, soft tissue curettage. A curette has a round end, unlike a scalar, which has a pointed end. So a curette, rounded, scalar, pointy. And there's two basic designs of curettes. Universal, which is designed to adapt to all two surfaces, and they have two cutting edges. And the Gracie has one cutting edge, and it's used for a specific area. And here is a picture of the curette. OK, so the uh, letter A, they use this curette a lot for the anterior and letter B, they use this one uh, mostly for the posterior. OK, and again, scalers are used to remove the supra gingival calculus, so supra above and the curettes are used to remove the subgingival, which is below. Here's another picture of what a curette and a scalar looks like. Again, look at the curette is more rounded and the scalar is more pointed at the tip. Um, and again, that's why I tell you be careful because this is so pointy, uh, you can get pricked with it, okay? A um, uh, uh, curette usually resembles a spoon excavator, okay? And again, the scale is sharp and the curette is rounded. Now, the universal curettes are designed so that one instrument can be used on all two surfaces, as I mentioned. There's two cutting edges, one on each side of the blade, and uh, the curettes, again, they resemble the spoon. Gracie curettes have only one cutting edge, and they are used only in specific areas. Uh, they're designed for like the mesial or the distal. Treatment of the entire dentition requires the use of several curettes. So again, 
you might see the hygienists have a whole bunch and um when you come to lab too and also please look in your instrument book in your instrument book in the periodontal um section and in your kindle you will have these pictures please take a look at it because the doctor uh if he even if he's not uh doing a cleaning but once in a while if he's working on a tooth and there's calculus he's going to tell you to go and get a curet or uh or a scalar and you're going to need to know the difference so please again look at your instruments so again here is a curette here's some more and they come of course in different sizes okay and then we have what's called surgical knives a uh, kirkland knife is one of the most commonly used knives in periodontal surgery it's usually double-ended and it has like these kidney shaped blades an orbin knife is used to remove tissue from the interdental areas that's in between shaped like spears and has cutting edges on both sides of its blades. Periotones are used to cut periodontal ligaments for autotraumatic tooth extraction. They're thin, sharp blades that cause minimal damage to periodontal ligaments and surrounding alveolar bone. Um, again, interdentals in between. Here is your gingivectomy knives, and this is what they mean by kidney shape. Okay, so A is Kirkland and B is Orbin. Again, this is pointy, so it could go in between interdental, all right? Pocket markers. So they're similar in appearance to cotton pliers. However, one tip is smooth and straight and the other is sharp and bent at a right angle. The smooth tip of the pocket marker is inserted at the base of the pocket and when the instrument is pressed together, the sharp tip makes small perforations in the gingiva. These perforations, which are referred to as bleeding points, are used to outline the area for an incision on the gingiva. So this is what it looks like. So it almost looks like, again, like cotton pliers, but what you don't see, and again, when you come to a uh, lab, I'll show you one. It has a very sharp point on one end. They squeeze it to the gum and see, they will make these markings like this on the gum. And this is where the doctor will take the knife and cut. So this is uh, all the infected tissue that he will be removing. Now the ultrasonic scaler allows for rapid calculus removal and reduces hand fatigue for the operator. It works by converting very high frequency sound waves into mechanical energy in the form of very rapid vibration. A spray of water at the tip prevents the buildup of heat and provides a continuous flushing of debris and bacteria from the base of the pocket. Because of the spray of water at the tip, there's a large amount of potentially contaminated aerosol spray. So um, usually when the hygienist is using the ultrasonic scaler, if there's an assistant available, she might ask them to come in to use the HV because there's a lot of water and spray. Um, otherwise, she'll be using the scaler and the HV on her own doing both at the same time or even the saliva ejector. These are some of the designs of the ultrasonic tips. Of course, they are uh, they're designed to be used in different areas of the mouth. And also, if the uh, calculus is a lot, they'll start off with the ultrasonic tip and then they'll go on to the scalers and the curettes. And this is what it looks like. And this is how it sprays the water. OK, now this is one of those instruments that when you take it off, uh, the hose, make sure you wipe it down and bag it. Do not uh, drop it in the ultrasonic. Uh, it can be autoclave, but it should not be put in the ultrasonic. It ruins uh, the mechanism on it. OK, and then oh, and another thing, um, some people call this ultrasonic and some people call this the Cavitron. OK, make yourself a note of that because if the doctor asks you to get the uh, ultrasonic tips or the Cavitron, this is what he's talking about. Now, what, why, uh, what's indications for use of the ultrasonic scaler? Again, removal of supergingival calculus and difficult stains. Removal of subgingival calculus, attached plaque and endotoxins from the root surface. Cleaning of furcation areas. Removal of deposits before periodontal surgery. Removal of orthodontic cements or debonding. And removal of overhanging margins of restorations. Um, and the only kind of stains that we can remove with the ultrasonic 
is extrinsic. Extrinsic means outside on the two, not inside. Some things are inside and some things are outside. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, contraindications when not to use the ultrasonic scaler, communicable disease, a patient with a known communicable disease that can be transmitted by aerosol, such as tuberculosis, poses a risk to the operator. Immunocompromised, a compromised patient is open to infection, respiratory problems, materials can be aspirated into the lungs of a patient with respiratory problems, swallowing difficulty, problems with swallowing or severe gag reflex, and cardiac pacemaker. Consultation with the patient's cardiologist is necessary. Now, oral conditions uh, contraindicating demineralized areas. The ultrasonic vibrations can remove the areas of remineralization that begin to cover the demineralization. Exposed dentinal surfaces, tooth structure can be removed, resulting in tooth sensitivity. Result, uh, restorative materials, some restorative materials can be damaged by the ultrasonic vibration. Titanium implant abutments, unless a special plastic sheath is used to cover the tip, the ultrasonic tooth will damage titanium surfaces and narrow periodontal pockets. The tips will not fit into very narrow subgingival pockets. Uh, the ultrasonic also is not commonly used on children because they can cause damage to newer teeth, uh, newer tissue and teeth. So again, we don't really use it because their uh, tissues are very sensitive and the vibrations um, and the ultra ultrasonic gets a little bit hot, okay? And it, again, it can damage the uh, pulp tissue or the permanent teeth. So far, does anybody have any questions before I continue? No, no, no. Okay, non-surgical periodontal treatment. So dental prophylaxis, prophys, These, this is what we were doing in the lab, prophylaxis, or prophys for short, <clears throat> is the complete removal of calculus. Now that, we don't do the calculus, the hygienist does, we do the um, supra above, they do the sub, okay? Sub. Uh, soft deposits, plaque, and stains from all supergingival and unattached subgingival tooth surfaces. Dentists and dental hygienists are the only members of the dental health team who are licensed to perform this procedure. Prophylaxis is indicated for patients with healthy gingiva as a preventative measure and is most commonly performed during recall appointments and also is the primary treatment for gingivitis. Now, Scaling, group planing, and gingival curatage. This here is done by the hygienist and it's part of their periodontal debridement. And in some cases, gingival curatage, that's a non surgical technique, may also be indicated. And sometimes local anesthetic has to be given because they go below the gums. Okay. Uh, necrotic, if you guys don't remember what necrotic means, necrotic means dead. And the goal of debridement is to remove deposits on the tooth and reduce the buyer burden within the pocket. Here is an example of scaling and root planing. So again, they'll use their uh, curettes uh, to go below, okay? So sub gingival, so they'll go below the gums. Scaling, scalers are used to remove supra gingival calculus from the tooth surface. Curettes, again, um, are used to remove both supra and sub. Some areas on the root surface may be may remain rough after calculus removal. This is because the cementum has become necrotic, which again I said is dead, or because the scaling has produced grooves and scratches in the cementum. Um, root planing is performed after scaling. Procedures to remove any remaining particles of uh, calculus and necrotic cementum embedded in the root surfaces. After root planing, the surfaces of the root are smooth and glass-like. Smooth root surfaces resist new calculus formation and are easier for the patient to keep clean. So when your teeth are smooth, everything kind of glides off. When you have um, the plaque on it, the calculus, it just keeps on building up, building up, building up. 
Now, gingival curettage means scraping or cleaning with a curette. Some patients also require gingival curettage in addition to scaling and root planing. Uh, gingival curettage, also referred to as subgingival curettage, is the scraping of the gingival lining of a periodontal pocket, and this is to perform. Uh, this is performed to remove necrotic tissue from the pocket wall. Antimicrobial and antibiotic agents. So tetracycline is an antibiotic that is particularly useful for the treatment of periodontitis, early onset periodontitis, and rapidly destructive periodontitis. Penicillin is less effective against periodontal disease infections than any other antibiotics because many periodontal pathogens are resistant to it. Fluoride mouth rinses have been shown to reduce bleeding by delaying bacterial growth in the periodontal pockets. And a twice daily chlorhexidine rinse, rinse is the most effective means available for reducing plaque and gingivitis. So when, when a patient goes to get treatment, they usually get the whole regimen of what they need to use. They'll get the rinse in the office or the doctor will write them a prescription for it, one or the other. Locally delivered antibiotics. New methods can be used to apply antibiotics directly into the periodontal pockets. In one technique, a fiber that contains tetracycline is packed into periodontal pockets that have not responded to other methods. Other methods include using a syringe to insert dissolvable materials such as a gel into the pocket. In another technique, a dissolvable chip that releases chlorhexidine is inserted into deep pockets. So again, depends on what the hygienist and the doctor recommends for the patient. If they recommend it, they'll put the antibiotic straight into the pockets. Uh, it is costly. I will say that this type of cleaning is costly in itself. Um, the, the antibiotics delivered into the gums is another cost. So again, it would also depend on what the patient can afford. Um, but if they want to help their periodontal disease, you know, this would be the way to go. Surgical periodontal treatment. So sometimes cleanings are not enough. And then, uh, so when non-surgical treatment is ineffective in stopping the disease process, periodontal surgery is indicated to control the progress of periodontal destruction and loss of attachment. The advantages of periodontal surgery, the primary advantage is that it allows access to the root surface for scaling and root planing. Surgery makes it easier for the patient to clean difficult areas and also results in better access to frication in other areas that are very difficult to reach during traditional scaling and root planing. Disadvantages, the health status of the patient or age of the patient as well as limitations of the procedures. From the patient's point of view, the disadvantages of surgery usually include time, costs, aesthetics, and discomfort. The dental assistant usually has developed a good rapport with the patient and is in a unique position to discuss these concerns with the patient. Remaining bone, the amount of remain, uh, bone remaining around a tooth is an important consideration in the decision to perform periodontal surgery. When large amounts of bone are around a tooth, the dentist may take a wait and see approach, postponing or avoiding periodontal surgery. When this, with this approach, patient must practice excellent home care and routine dental care. If the amount of bone is already reduced, delaying the surgery may drastically lessen the chance of saving the tooth. Again, it's really important that when a patient has any type of periodontal treatment that they come back and follow up you need to stress that because if you don't, they're going to go right back to where they were. They might need surgery again. They might need that deep cleaning again. We're trying to avoid that and keep the area real nice and clean. Here shows some bone loss. So letter A, when some bone is present, it may be safe to postpone surgery and take a wait and safe uh, C approach. When half the bone has been lost, like in B, an additional two millimeters uh, loss can seriously jeopardize the tooth. Therefore, surgery is highly recommended. And in letter C, with, with advanced bone loss, surgery may be performed in an effort to save the tooth, but the prognosis is poor. We really need to let the patient know that we can do all this work and they can pay all this money, but if it's in letter C, they might have to know, you know, they have to know 
that um, the tooth may not be savable after all. So when it, again, when is surgery usually necessary? When the amount of bone is drastically reduced. And basic measures a patient can take to prevent this type of bone loss by getting regular dental checkups and professional cleaning, brushing their teeth, well, twice a day, cleaning daily between the teeth, which is the flossing, eating a well-balanced diet. These are things as a dental assistant needs to know to give uh, patients the, uh, the knowledge of what they need to do. Excis excisional periodontal surgery, this surgery is used to remove the excess tissue. It is the most rapid means of reducing periodontal pockets. Gingivectomy and gingival plasty are common types of excisional surgeries. Excisional, excisional is when they're cutting, okay? So again, gingivectomy, gingivoplasty, and uh, ectomy means excision. So excision, cutting with a surgical knife. Now, gingivectomy is the surgical removal of diseased gingival tissues. This procedure is performed when it is necessary to reduce the depth of the periodontal pocket and when fibrous gingival tissues must be removed. The surgical procedure involves making bleeding points with the use of pocket markers and removing the gingival tissues with periodontal knives and scissors. Gingivectomy, recently the use of dental laser equipment in gingivectomy has become popular. So if the doctor has a laser, um, they'll show you how to use the laser and always make sure that you wear the goggles when the laser is in effect because you cannot look at that light. And then after healing, it is easier for the patient to clean an area in which the pockets have been reduced. Gingivoplasty. It involves the surgical reshaping and contouring of the gingival tissues. The presence of deep periodontal pockets with fibrous tissue is the main indication for both gingivectomy and gingival plasty. Often both procedures are performed simultaneously. During gingival plasty, the gingiva are recontoured with the use of periodontal knives, rotary diamond burrs, curettes, and surgical scissors. Gingival margins are thin and are given scallop edges. So when the doctor performs this surgery, he kind of try to put the tissue looking like the way it was, it's just gonna be shorter because he's cutting tissue. So he's removing the diseased gingival tissue and he'll reshape it and contour it again. Incisional surgery, that's also known as periodontal flap or simple flap surgery. It's performed when excisional surgery is not indicated. Uh, the dentist may perform thorough scaling and root planing of exposed root surfaces and then moving the flap laterally to cover root surfaces of an adjacent tooth and then recontouring of on underlying bone. And when they do a flap, then the flap is usually closed and sutured into place. And this is the time when we come in and we do periodontal dressing. So we put a dressing over any type of surgery that the doctor wants us to uh, do. So that way the area can uh, basically heal really well. Uh, periodontal dressing is like if you had a broken arm and they put a cast that's there to help the arm heal. Well, the periodontal dressing gets like that. Um, it gets really hard and we leave it on there for a few days and we'll get more into that. Osseo bone surgery, periodontal surgery that involves modification of the supporting bone. This surgery is performed to eliminate pockets remove defects, and to restore normal contours in the bone. There's two types, osteoplasty and osteoectomy. Each one requires surgical exposure of the bone, followed by recontouring with the use of a rotary diamond burr uh, or a bone chisel. Um, in order to reach the bone, the periosteum must be reflected. That means that we have to pull it back. Osteoplasty or additive surgery, bone is contoured and reshaped. In addition, bone may be added either through bone grafting, that means taking bone from one area and placing it in another, or placement of bone substitute materials. So it could be, a uh, bone can be used from anything such as like cadavers, which you should know as dead people, or substitute uh, bone from animals or synthetic bone. So again, it all depends on what kind of bone the doctor has. 
This procedure is useful in some patients with bone defects caused by periodontal disease. Osteoectomy or subtractive surgery, bone is removed. This procedure is necessary when the patient has large exotosis, which is bony growth. For example, osteoectomy is performed if a patient needs a denture and the bony growth would interfere with the comfort and fit of the denture. Um, you will see this a lot in some of the patients and they don't even know that they have it. These are very difficult also when you're going to take uh, x-rays because they get in your way. I'm going to try to post um, those bony growths on Telegram so you guys can see what they look like. Crown lengthening, a surgical procedure that is designed to expose more tooth structure for the placement of a restoration such as a crown. It is becoming very common procedure for aesthetic anterior restorations. Surgical crown lengthening may involve the removal of soft tissue and alveolar bone. In addition to aesthetics, indications for crown lengthening include a tooth that is fractured close to the gingival margin or alveolar crest and subgingival caries. Soft tissue graft, pedicle graft that's used to, uh, used to move gingiva from an adjacent teeth or dentulous area to a recipient site on another tooth. The pedicle graft is freed on three sides but remains attached on one side and retains its blood supply. Um, this is used basically, basically for a single site. So like if uh, the gum area on one tooth is really low and the root is showing, they might move a little bit of the gum uh, from the tooth next to it to that area just to cover it a little bit. Free gingival soft tissue graft has a donor site that is located away from the grafted site. The blood supply is not attached to the graft and depends on the recipient site. Post-surgical patient instructions. So try to remember that after every single procedure we do in an office, there's always post-ops. And you have to know all the post-ops for every single procedure. In this case, after surgery, the periodontist will most likely prescribe an analgesic and possibly an antibiotic. Uh, they also recommend a rinse about twice a day to help with plaque control. Chlorhexidine is usually the most common one, and it can be used during the first week to freshen the mouth and inhibit plaque information, uh, formation during the early stages of healing. And postoperative instructions should be given to the patient to ease discomfort and promote healing. And sometimes we even make a post-op appointment for them to come back so we can see how everything is healing. And uh, at that time to just, you know, give the patient comfort to know that we do care. Now, here's what I mentioned before, per periodontal surgical dressing. So also known as periopac. It holds the flap in place, protects the newly forming tissue. It minimizes post-operative pain, infection, and hemorrhage. It protects the surgical site from trauma during eating and drinking, and it supports mobile teeth during the healing process. The most commonly used one is ZOE or zinc oxide eugenol or non-eugenol. Now, some patients may experience redness and burning pain in the area of the dressing. They're supplied either as powder and a liquid that are mixed before use or also as toothpaste, not toothpaste, two different kind of paste, a base and a catalyst. Material may be mixed ahead of time, wrapped in wax paper and frozen for future use. That's if you use the powder and the liquid. Zoe has a slow set time, which allows for a longer working time, sets to a firm, heavy consistency and provides good protection for tissues and flap. Some patients are allergic to the eugenol, and if they are, then you have to use the one that has no eugenol. So again, this is the one with the um, liquid and the powder. You know, we pretty much did away with this one. We use the other one that uh, we use in lab, and it looks like this, the non-eugenol dressing, the base and the catalyst. It's the most widely used type of periodontal disease uh, dressing. It comes in two tubes, as I mentioned, a base and accelerator or base and a catalyst. It's easy to mix and place and has a smooth surface for patient comfort. It has a rapid setting time. If exposed to warm temperatures and uh, in the mouth, it will set quicker because it's warm in the mouth. And it cannot be mixed in advance and stored. Now, that's the only disadvantage uh, prior to the other one. The other one, you can mix it, store it, and use it as needed. But again, 
Um, this is the most widely used one now. OK, this one here and here uh, you have your mixing pad and a tongue depressor and you use that to mix both together. OK, um, some people have the paper cup filled with room temperature water and some saline solution to rinse the area. And uh, the other thing that's not listed on here, but we use is a plastic type filling instrument. The most common one is called the Woodson. Now, aesthetic and plastic periodontal surgery, it's used to enhance the aesthetic appearance. Teeth and tissues must appear natural and healthy. And the restoration of teeth is critical for restorations to be functional and aesthetic. The periodontum must be healthy. To remain healthy, restorations must be properly designed in place. And periodontal plastic surgery procedures are used to correct defects in the shape, position, or amount of gingival tissue. Again, I mentioned before, lasers have become uh, more common in the office, so a lot of doctors are using lasers. It's an acronym for light amplification by simulated emission of radiation. A laser beam is a highly concentrated beam of light. The power of this beam can be adjusted to enable it to cut vaporized or cauterized tissues. Um, again, it's the newest technology in dentistry and is spreading. Uh, it's the research that may lead to more widespread user uses of lasers in clinical dentistry continue. So again, they're using this a lot. Um, they use it to remove tumors and lesions, to excess tissues in uh, gingival plasty, ect gingival ectomy, phrenectomy. Phrenectomy is the frenum in the front between eight and nine, and down on the bottom you have a, a few frenums. We talked about this before. Removal of or reduction in hyperplastic tissues, control of the bleeding of vascular lesions. The advantages of laser surgery over conventional surgery, it heals faster than incisions made with electrosurgery. Hemostasis, it controls of bleeding is rapid. The surgical feel is relatively dry. The opportunity for bloodborne contamination is reduced. There are fewer traumas to adjacent tissue, less post-surgical swelling, scarring, and pain. Some procedures can be, formed, be performed more quickly. Patients who are afraid of surgery may accept this method. <clears throat> Precautions must be taken to protect both the patient and the dental staff during laser procedure. Any person who operates a laser or assists during a laser operation must be thoroughly trained in the use of this powerful instrument. So again, when you go to the office and they're using it, they will uh, uh, let you know. Things that are important now is shielded eyeglasses. You have to wear them, protect the eyes for both patients and staff. Matte finish instruments, reflective sur surfaces such as instrument mirrors and even polished restorations can reflect laser energy, so we got to be careful with that. Protection of non-target tissues, so non-target -tar oral tissues, tissues not being treated with the laser should be shielded with the use of a wet gauze pack and high volume evacuation should be used to draw off the plume, the cloud created when tissue vaporizes. This plume should be considered infectious. So make sure, again, when the doctor cauterizes the tissue, you have the HV right on top of it, not only to um, um, draw out the cloud, but, you know, it smells when you're cutting tissue. It smells like you're cutting tissue. So it smells like something is burning. So that's why it's really important to use the HVE. There should be a sign also that says danger laser operating if um, you are using this those signs should be up. And that is our lecture. And um, does anybody have any questions? <laughs>